stage today, uh, we've been joined by Stephen Sanofsky, who many of you saw yesterday. Uh, and so uh, we'll get started here. OK, so who has the first question? Let's have uh, paddle number two over there. Thank you. Um, uh, on Office, um, I know there's a development effort for Office for ARM. Um, but the question is Metro uh, interface for Office. Um, how critical is it to Windows 8 uh, adoption to have software that takes it full advantage of it, you know, Office with Metro? Now, it's only been about 15 months since the last release of Office. If we're, say, a year away, it's still kind of on the cusp. I'm not sure if you add, choose to add functionality to Office or you say, let's just do a Metro interface. If you could kind of share with us your thoughts, and particularly as it pertains to the adoption rate of Windows 8. Yeah, no, we're certainly, uh, as I said in my remarks this morning, supporting our platforms and having our platforms support innovation in our applications broadly uh, remains super important to us. Uh, the brilliance of the Windows 8 strategy, though, is we get all of the applications that come from Windows uh, on x86, as well as applications that have gone through the process of rethinking how they might work in a, in a Windows 8 world. And uh, when we have something that we want to talk about, we will. But uh, certainly, you ought to expect that we are rethinking and uh, uh, working hard um, what it would mean to do office uh, Metro style. We have another question. Paddle 2. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit. Y you mentioned yesterday that um, legacy applications will be able to run on Windows 8 regardless of, of the chipset that people are choosing. I was just wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about how that will happen. Does there have to be some emulator or, or app virtualization? But if you could kind of w walk us through um, what you're doing there. Sure. Um, I probably, I don't think I said quite that. I might have said that if it runs on a Windows 7 PC, it'll run on Windows 8. So all the Windows 7 PCs are um, x86 or 64-bit. Um, no, we've been very clear since, since the very first uh, CES demos and forward that the ARM, the ARM product, um, when we're complete, won't run any x86 applications. And we've done a bunch of work to enable that to enable a great experience there, particularly around devices and device drivers. We've built um, a great deal of what we call um, uh, class drivers with the ability to run all sorts of printers and peripherals and stuff out of the box um, with the ARM version. And what we talked about yesterday was, uh, what we announced yesterday for the first time was that when you write a Metro style application, all the tools w are there to enable you in any of the languages that we support to uh, automatically support ARM or x86. And I think that's the, the key part of, of everything that will we'll run. It is very interesting. I, I kind of want to encourage folks to, to think a little bit about it, because um, obviously there's a, a, there are technical reasons and technical capabilities that could allow several approaches. You know, if you start from the premise that Windows um, on ARM is a good thing, and that um, the role of an operating system is to abstract out hardware for software developers, which is essentially the definition of an operating system, then um, and then let the value, uni the unique value of that hardware shine through. And that's something that Windows does fairly uniquely, is constantly working to let innovations in hardware shine through in the operating system so that they all can show their uniqueness. The, the challenge is very interesting. If we, if we allow the world of x86 applications to port, like that are based on what we call desktop apps in our chart yesterday, then you know, there are real challenges in some of the value proposition for a system on a chip. You know, will battery life be as good, for example? Well, those applications aren't written to be really great in the face of, of limited battery constraints, which is a value proposition of the metro, the metro style apps. So we have to be careful that we don't remove the value proposition for those applications. On the other hand, people would say, oh, but you have to let them run because then there's that whole ecosystem. And then if we do let them run, we just brought the perceived negatives of some of the ecosystem. So people say, great, now it's easy to port viruses and malware, and we'll port those. So we've taken the approach that 
we're going to build a bunch of rich capabilities in the operating system that allow devices and peripherals and a broad range of form factors all to run, and working with multiple ARM partners um, on the ARM side, and then Intel and AMD on the broad system on a chip side, but then focus on the Metro-style applications as the opportunity. And so if you're a developer uh, across the street, you look at it, your opportunity just grew, because it's the Intel-based world um, and the AMD-based world plus the, the ARM-based world for Metro-style apps. So it's the whole run rate of all of those. Okay, who has the next question? All right, paddle three. This is a question on Windows Phone. Uh, and Steve, you spoke about the relevance of, of having a presence in both the consumer and the enterprise. You know, to date, most of the focus on the phone has been around the consumer. There's a lot of integration with, uh, with social, Xbox. But when you look at the competitive landscape, it would seem that you know, there might be a very promising opportunity to go after enterprise smartphones, particularly with some of the assets you have around security, like Active Directory. Um, what's your thinking about how you position the phone beyond the consumer and, and how you might balance security needs or, or you know, more com kind of compliant requirements uh, for this platform in the future? Yeah, the most important thing is to capture the hearts and minds of people. People work, people have personal lives, but people, and if we can all remember back long enough, the BlackBerry actually didn't come in as a, quote, enterprise solution. BlackBerry came in as something that individuals wanted and that corporations could support. Uh, you know, what we're trying to do is make sure we capture some imagination with people. I won't call them consumer people or enterprise people. Uh, V1, we had some things we still needed to do on our security and management story. Our 7.5 release is much stronger. We'll continue to drive that very hard. There certainly is a market opportunity, if you will, uh, that presents itself. But all good market opportunities have to start with some enthusiasm by people as people. OK, let's move over to paddle number one. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Cash Strong with Merrill Lynch. Steve, I was wondering, or anybody in the management team, how should we think about the, the tablet market in the enterprise? I think TV just made a point that BlackBerry was first more of a consumer device was brought into the enterprise. I'm just curious to think of uh, whether that might be the trajectory that the tablet in the enterprise market could proceed. Right now, it seems to be a mode of you buy it, you bring it in and support it. But could this be the extension of the, the corporate laptop for the mobile workforce? Can you help us think about how this might uh, look like, or how we could be doing our work as mobile working professionals in the future. And if you can comment on what could be the differentiation when the Windows tablet comes out relative to two other big competitors, that will also be great. Thank you. I think there's two, two separate things that you said, and they're both interesting. One is, will these things be brought in by consumers and eventually adopted by corporations? I'll comment on that. And the second is, are they PC? Uh, replacements, add-ons, how do they relate to the PC? Uh, I'll maybe start with the first and I'll let Stephen do, do, do the second. I mean, there's, there's really no question that any device a consumer can buy, uh, <laughs> they will. And corporations will eventually ask, do those devices have a place inside our environment for something? We'll talk about what they substitute for, what they don't. We're happy to talk about that. But the truth of the matter is, there will be applications inside enterprises for which the non-keyboard form factor is fine, for which ARM is appropriate, for which a lot of the things that we associate with the tablet today work. Uh, we embrace that concept. You can kind of see that in what we've done with, with Windows 8. We don't start by rejecting it. We start by embracing the fact that the form factor will have broad use for, quote, corporate purposes as well as individual purposes, and we'll uh, approach it that way. You want to talk about PCs and Yeah, I mean, plates? I think that, like, the, in a way, I, you know, in my head are all these stories from people stopping me on the way over here and stuff this, this, this week. But the, the most interesting thing was just, you know, the, the Windows tablet that we, we gave out to the paid attendees at the conference uh, today was, uh, or yesterday, you know, the thing that jazzed them the most was, like, they're, they're all professional engineers, and they run a whole suite of tools. And they all want to develop for, you know, well, I'll just say it this way, machines without keyboards. 
but they're afraid of, you know, the development cycle just slowing them down because you work over here and then the code has to move and then you try it out and then you don't like it, you have to go back here and you keep going back and forth. And so, you know, our demos yesterday, we did all the development on a machine without a built-in keyboard and just plugged in a, an external keyboard. And that, that ability for there not really to be a seam between something that's got no keyboard and something that has a permanent keyboard or an attachable keyboard, it turns out to be a fairly compelling proposition for a very large set of people who um, do use professional tools that at times require the precision of a keyboard and a mouse. And that was, for us, the most fascinating thing in developing Windows 8 up until this point, which we still have a bunch of work to do, has been um, the, the sort of this notion that first when you add touch, it turns out you just never want it to go away. And um, it's a really fascinating thing. I got mail from one of the reporters or one of the tech writers um, at our pre-show event for them, who's, who I told them, look, I promise you, about an hour after using it, the next computer you use without a touch screen will have fingerprints on the screen. And at 8.30 that night, the event ended at about 7, he sent me mail saying it, it took me 30 minutes, and then it took me 30 seconds to realize why my computer was frozen. Because he just kept touching his ThinkPad that didn't have a touch screen. And so that, that thing where you, all of a sudden it just becomes part of what you're doing means that this line of, you know, touches over here and laptops are over here, it just, it was arbitrary. And I think the excitement that our PC manufacturers and OEMs see is that they can just develop all these unique form factors with, with software like Windows 8 and not think about falling off a cliff and then people buying machines can buy something that they don't have to compromise on. And, and I think that's going to be, it means that it's going to be very hard to draw this pie chart of what the type of machine is that's being sold. The, the thing we, we would say for sure is Windows 8 systems will cannibalize Windows 7 systems. Uh, and, and that, that's for sure. And I think what's really important is that that consumerization of IT strategy, you bring your own device to work. We have a very comprehensive strategy for that if, beyond devices, beyond the OS, with the systems management, which becomes very important to manage our devices and everybody else's, with the productivity story, with Office as the lead there, and then certainly from the, the de development model, which matters more and more to companies because they don't want to rewrite these applications six or eight times depending upon the flavor of the device. So the comprehension of our story is where our strength is and that's what we're really going to lean into uh, in, in this current year and then next year as well. I'll give you one data point from this room. I'd say people in this room can probably get about whatever they want to bring to this meeting. My tally would tell you it's about 20% paper. Paper is popular in this group still. I think you've got about 70% by my tally plus where people want a keyboard. Uh, and then you've got about 5, 10% of people here who are happy with touch only or adapted touch machines. That's, I count in every room I go to. Uh, I do a rough <laughs> count. And so I think you're going to see all of the device classes to continue to persist into the future. Hopefully paper's the one we can do most to get rid of. Uh, no. Well, no, I mean, in a sense, you could say the, a lot of innovation before we have machines that people will feel comfortable with not using pencil and paper, and that's, that's a big opportunity. All right, let's go to paddle three. Hi, it's uh, Adam Holt from Morgan Stanley. I'm just going to tuck my notebook in my bag there. Um, <laughs> I have a, uh, a big Warehouse. picture question. This isn't a guidance question, uh, so we'll call it a big picture question. Uh, Peter, in your presentation, you talked about 10% revenue growth per annum over the last five years, which is obviously uh, terrific for a company of your size. It almost sounds like you all are more optimistic about the potential for growth going forward, even though you know, the macro appears to be slowing. Is that a, a true statement, uh, first of all? And then secondly, does that imply that you think that Microsoft continues to decouple further over some of the markets where you know, historically you've been more tied, like servers? PCs, et cetera. That may be a question for Steve or Peter or, or Kevin. Yeah, I'll start. The, the context I was trying to give was obviously a view on the markets we're addressing, and clearly the growth opportunity in those markets and the trends that drive them, sort of, uh, you know, sort of abstracting out sort of macroeconomics because this was sort of a longer term view. It's a five year view. So what I was trying to highlight was the, the sort of macro trends and the underlying trends in each of those that drive the opportunity. Clearly, the second piece of that is our ability to uh, continue to take share across those markets. And so 
uh, our view is the opportunity is tremendous. Steve highlighted that at the end. It's as great as it's ever been, um, but it's also very competitive. It's also fast changing, um, but the opportunity is there, and then it becomes just about our ability and our positioning of our products and our services to take advantage of that opportunity without a reference to some short-term macroeconomic issues. Now, you know, the markets are going to go up and down, and spin's going to go up and down, but if you look across our very broad portfolio of products and solutions and services, we would have strong uh, expectations inside the company that we're going to grow share in most, most of those, if not, you know, aspire to grow in all, but we're going to grow share in most all of those. And, and, and there will be some areas where we won't, and clearly we're going to attack those, but we don't sit around saying, gosh, you know, we're, we're going to lose share across the board and, and, and grow. We're going to try to grow ahead of the market, and that's, that's the way we're running the company, and that's what we try to do in every category that we compete in. Yeah. We're also not working too hard to forecast the macro economic picture. Uh, I'm not sure there's anybody terribly good at that, but we're not going to be pretend to be better than anybody else. That's right. Let's go to paddle four in the back and then paddle one over here. Hi guys, uh, Jason Maynard. I have a two-parter on the uh, Windows 8 roadmap and vision. Um, first, in the next few years, do you think Microsoft will have one OS that rules all your devices, or do you think you'll have two platforms that sort of borrow some of the best features from each other? So think about how smartphones fit into this long term. And then the second piece is your cloud services, you've had a lot of nice one-off products that live in the cloud for consumers, but they still feel fairly disjointed that there isn't sort of a unifying element among all of those services. And so I'm curious, how do you see that part coming together? Because in a world where I have an Xbox, a Windows smartphone, I might have a couple devices, I've got home, it feels like the software's got to tie this stuff together a lot better. There's got to be a, you know, the rug to tie the room together. And it doesn't sort of seem like that's all together today. So I'm curious how you ta tackle those two questions. Do you want me to do the first? Do you want to do the second? Or? Either way. OK. Yeah. Um, OK, so the, the first question, um, obviously for the next couple years, what we talked about yesterday on the Windows 8 side is what the Windows 8 side is. There, there's not an a, a additional work I can offer there. We showed for, the, for developers, we actually showed a fairly significant amount of work that we've done at um, if you're a developer and you want to share code between the two, the Windows Phone 7.5 and, and, um, and Windows 8, we, we showed a whole bunch of copy and paste and sharing of code that was pretty substantial. And that was one of the things that talking to the attendees that they were most excited about. And they all recognize from a product design challenge, you know, the user interface of a sub, you know, four inch and below screen and a, say, a nine inch and above screen are very, very different designs, not just technology, it's just very different designs. But that said, even, you know, we've gone through this sequence of steps in sharing code um, between both uh, Windows and uh, the phone. We started the first Windows Phone 7 um, under the hood, used the Windows graphics engine. We call it DirectX. And so a bunch of sharing so that the, that was building the groundwork for what came next, which was Internet Explorer 9. So the ability on the phone, on the current phone now to use Internet Explorer comes from having shared all of that code. And so today, you know, every day the Internet Explorer team, every code change they make is a code change that is available to the next release of the phone as well. And so we have that, that kind of thing uh, going on. And that actually bridges to the second question because it's a, a tricky one to answer because it starts off from you know, a qualitative assessment so that I, I'm not sure I totally agree with, but I'll just uh, uh, let, you, let you assert and say we could always do better. But, you know, the phone today is a great example of where, you know, you sign on, you get a brand new phone, pull it out of the box and sign on, and, you know, all of your live mail, your live calendar, um, using Windows Live as the umbrella for all of those, your calendar, your photos, and your mail, your contacts, all just uh, show up and your connection to SkyDrive with those photos literally by just signing on with that ID. And now there's more work we can do. You can use that, that ID across other services at Microsoft and there's always more work to do to, to connect those. But certainly the phone and Windows Live is a great example. And then a bunch of the work that we've done in, in Office and, and sharing the, your documents through SkyDrive with that same I, Live ID is, is also there as well. And then yesterday we showed the Windows Live that we're working on that's 
got Metro style clients that run on Windows 8 where when you sign on to Windows 8 with your live ID, you get your mail and your calendar, your contacts and your data and store it in the cloud, all synced across all of your PC devices plus your, your phone, and then continue to extend that to um, roaming your settings that are on your PC. So your desktop background and screensaver kind of stuff, all, all will roam, you know, what languages you type in, spelling dictionaries and things like that, all roam across all of your, your PCs. And believe me, once you've actually experienced this PC roaming uh, this way, it's, it's, it's really kind of a, a game changer for you. You just, all the machines we used yesterday were signed on with your, with live IDs. That was actually because if they crashed, we could recreate them quickly. Uh, turned out to be handy. But um, we also, uh, but you know, you, you sign on, you start browsing, and all of a sudden you realize that the things that you browsed last time at your machine at, over here are right there available for you. So you, you're always, that autocomplete is working everywhere and the spelling suggestions are working everywhere and it's, it's really phenomenal and that's actually part of using the Windows Live infrastructure to roam and it's optional, you don't have to use it and it, it, you can just choose to sign up that way. There are kind of two things in the second part. One is the, let me call it the cloud service infrastructure uh, and getting that coherent and I thought Chris and, and uh, Steven did a good job on that. ID, people, SkyDrive slash storage, and then there's secondly, you know, what are the killer applications? And certainly Skype has a key role to play there uh, as, a, as a very popular consumer-based application with a lot of forward momentum. And I think it'll be an important part of the mix. Great, let's go to paddle number two, right to the right over there. <laughs> Keep him running. He's nicely had his hand up. Mark Merdler, oops, Mark Merdler, Sanford Bernstein. Uh, so Yahoo is obviously a key part of Microsoft's go forward strategy, as shown today, um, even on the slides. Uh, but there's some change in management recently, some shareholder disconsent, some problems with what the direction is. How well positioned is Microsoft long term if there's a serious management change or, <coughs> change or even a sale of the company? Why don't you start? Mm -hmm. So our partnership. Uh, the 10 year relationship that we had between our two companies uh, is delivering values for both companies and the nature of the contract that survives change controls by the contract itself. But the, our fundamental focus is always about delivering values to our users, to our advertisers. And in that context, we've been really making uh, big strides and the teams continue to collaborate uh, even with the recent changes uh, in the Yahoo management, that doesn't really impact day-to-day to day how the engineering teams are working together, how the advertising sales teams are working with the platform teams. So in that context, which is going to continue to be very focused on delivering consumer value, experience values, and advertising ROIs, that, that should be our fundamental focus. Hundreds of millions of people, you know, every day are using Yahoo services, and with a change of management or no change of management, Hundreds of millions of people are still using Yahoo services. And uh, I'm obviously, some of what you read in the newspaper must be true in terms of the dialogue and the debate and where to take the company. But there's hundreds of millions of people every day using those services, including Bing, which is embedded. And uh, we've talked certainly with Tim Morris, who's the acting CEO, and the partnership will remain strong no matter where they want to take either their business or a good partner or whoever they happen to install uh, next is, as CEO. It's, a, it's important for them and it's important for us. And I think you can see us continue to focus on what we can control, which is what she talked about, which is growing our share every month. That, that's, that's what we talk about and focus on in the company. And I think that's an important part that no matter what happens there, we're gonna continue to stay focused on. Great, let's go to paddle three. Thanks, John DeFucci from JP Morgan. Um, Windows 8's seen a lot of, it's, it's a lot of excitement here, right? And you can see why. We all got a chance to play with it. It's, it's a great product. It's still early, you keep saying, and, and that's, that's good that you keep saying that. We understand that. Um, it was whoever had the idea to give those slates or tablets away to all the developers, that's a fantastic idea, I, I personally think. I think only could have been a little bit better if you extended it maybe another couple hundred. It would have. <laughs> <laughs> but, but my, 
you complimented the guy, and then you wanted I was to make him pull I his knew. hair out. <laughs> well, it worked. Yeah, you can't do that. And I knew there was a there was a punchline. I was just, what could it be? <laughs> More free stuff. Be pulling his hair out, like pulling my hair out, but. Um, there's been a lot of talk here at this meeting about growth. Oh, that was not your question. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> no, but it, it sort of leads into it. There's, a, there's been a lot of talk about growth and, and share. And Peter, when you were up there, you talked about bottom line growth depending on a lot of things. But one of those things was, was mix. And since Windows and Office is primarily, um, is, drives most of the bottom line anyway, and they're primarily driven by PC unit sales, and we've seen what's happened to those numbers. Um, should we expect to see bottom line growth sort of sort of subside relative even if even if the top line growth the total aggregate growth of the company continues at a robust rate will bottom line growth sort of fall off a bit at least until Windows 8 comes out which will help to it, it, realizing that PC unit sales Steve mentioned macro issues and you're not going to look at those or you, you're going to look at them but you can't predict them but they're I'll, I'll make the assumption that tablets are having an effect on that too. So could we see bottom line growth actually not keep up with top line growth, at least in the short term over the next few quarters? Well, I'll get started. I mean, I wasn't speaking towards obviously short term guidance on what we think bottom line is going to do. I was merely painting a picture of the longer term opportunity and our ability to you know, ride the trends and gain share. As Kevin said, it's kind of what we're focused on every day. So clearly, the biggest leverage point for us is to, is to do that. And over time, operating profits will grow. Uh, that was not making a short-term sort of guidance statement about profits. Yeah, I, I mean, look, it, you can ask the same question in any one of about 25 ways. So yeah. let me answer them in all ways. <laughs> we'll give you no guidance, none. And when, if the sh percentage of revenue that has real cogs associated with it grows faster than the percentage of revenue that doesn't have real cogs associated with it, that has a mathematical implication. And Peter's already told you what else is going on because that's the only piece left is the OpEx piece. So mm -hmm. the, the math is always the case and so it always gets back to let's speculate on what's going on. Uh, you know, the PC market will grow, not as fast as it has in years past, but it is a growth market. It's a large market. Certainly the server market is growing great guns. Mm -hmm. We have nothing really still but share upside in the search business, in the ERP business, in the phone business, uh, no question. We actually have had rousing success with Windows 7, including, as Kevin talked about, penetration into emerging markets that were high piracy markets. Uh, we have competitive challenges, no doubt, in the mid-size screen form factor, PCs, tablets, slates. On the other hand, you know, it'll be a year where all slates will certainly be collectively a much smaller, much, much smaller market than all PCs. And we got our work cut out for us, but the math stays the math, and anything else we say basically is a speculation about, or a kind of guidance on revenue, which I think we'll pass on for today. So I think no guidance, no tablet. Oh. <laughs> Let's go to paddle two. Uh, I'm Brendan Barnacle from Pacific Crest, and uh, thanks so much for having us in this forum. This has been really useful to combine the analyst day with an event like this. I hope you do this going forward. Um, second, we saw more devices than ever before running on Windows with Windows 8. That's likely to continue, more diversity of platforms. Are we going to see any change in the pricing strategy behind those, given that diversity of platform and support and devices? Yeah, we haven't talked at all about the forward plans for uh, Windows. Uh, we're not going to talk about them today. We haven't shared them yet with the customers that we work with most closely. And when there's something to say, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure we will appropriately uh, try to keep you educated. But right now, our OEMs are still in the process. They've been working with Steven's team now for, for a while, uh, but we're sort of evolving to the next phase uh, in those discussions, particularly now that the developer preview is open. So there's really nothing new to say today at all. Okay, let's go to paddle two. Great. Um, 
question, another question on Windows for you. Um, one takeaway I had in the, in the keynote session, uh, Stephen's keynote yesterday, is, is a lot of this stuff on Windows 8 really benefits from a network effect where if I have, you know, in my house three PCs, they're all on Windows 8, I have this, you know, sort of getting all my media from one PC, I've got the roaming capabilities, and then you've got this developer model that you're layering on top that really, going forward, opens up a new possibility of application. So I guess the question is, is there a way to bring some of that value back into the installed base? Um, you know, I don't know if it's a if it's an essentials pack or something that sort of enables somebody that that isn't going to upgrade all three PCs right away to see the value and potentially do that in the future. And then a related question around non-Windows devices. Um, you know, I'm a PC user. I've got all my content locked up in iTunes. You know, my wife's got them all locked, all her books locked up in the Kindle reader. Um, it seems like you guys talked about the best experiences on a Windows device and best in class on other devices. I'm just wondering if you could put a little more meat behind that around what are you going to do going forward to try to get at that um, value that's locked up in other platforms and leverage it. Sure. Um, well, there, for a long time there was, there was always this, you know, hey, can we carve off bits and pieces of what's new and put it on the old version of Windows? And historically the lessons we learned from that were um, it, it doesn't really deliver a high quality experience for the end user or the developer. Like there's always more that they want to take advantage of than we can kind of do. I mean, and especially if, you know, using the words from yesterday, if we're, you know, reimagining Windows from the chips to the interface, well, you can't put all the chips to the interface onto the machine without just a, an upgrade. And so one of the things we're going to really focus on is making a really good, clean and easy upgrade from Windows 7 machines. And that's will represent the most substantial opportunity for, for developers in terms of older PCs and, and hardware that might be interested in getting new software and new applications and, and even new peripherals and devices. Um, we, do, we do for non, I'll say it as non-Windows 7 devices and non-Windows 8 devices, we do some limited amount of work where we think it, it really completes the scenario, but it's also another area where where you kind of inherently are competing with, you know, the person or entity that provides that, that functionality sort of, quote, natively on that, that platform. And it's usually pretty, pretty tricky in, in that regard. Um, we provide Messenger on, on a couple of platforms. Certainly, we've struggled, just like all ISVs, over how to support Android and to what degree if we wanted to do chat across there or, or SkyDrive. But the place that we're really focused is on um, like all the Windows Live things, is on the HTML5 implementation. And so our assumption going forward is that any device that you really want to interact with that isn't a, a Windows device will have a really great HTML5 browsing experience. And if you have that, then our services will be available to you. And then just keep in mind your iTunes example. It runs on a Windows 7 PC today, so it's going to keep running on a Windows 8 PC and doing the things that it does on Windows 8 PCs. Cert just certainly, and Steve, Steve made an important point, I just want to be clear. Our services, Bing is another good example. Skype, we've, we, one of the things I stressed as we announced the Skype acquisition is we would continue to support uh, Android, iOS, Mac, et cetera, with, uh, with the Skype client. I think your question seemed to have more concern the other way. Stephen pointed to the fact that we have uh, compatibility, but certainly, Amazon is, is an example. They may have a device competitor, but they have certainly behaved like their fundamental business is the service. They've done a lot to try to have good support of other folks' device. We welcome them. We'd welcome, you know, Metro-style apps from Amazon. We'd welcome Metro-style application from Apple in the iTunes case. I'm not, don't know what we'll see there, but we'd certainly welcome those. And because of compatibility, there's certainly a path forward for, for everybody. Mr. Reback, you're going to be our last question. Oh, it wasn't Mr. Reback. Oh. <laughs> uh, Brad can, uh, can maybe go in uh, after me. So. Yes, no, you will be our last question. All right, then. <laughs> so I actually wanted to, you know, with all the focus on Windows 8, I actually wanted to talk briefly about Office 365. And, you know, it's great to see it get off to a strong start. Uh, I was hoping to maybe get a little bit more visibility uh, into deployments or, uh, or what's in the pipe. Uh, so in other words, you know, how is the mix shaping up right now with regard to new customers, 
uh, embracing uh, uh, Office 365 versus existing customers, extending into the cloud, and then also, you know, what sort of applications are leading the way? I would imagine Exchange. Uh, are you seeing decent uh, uh, uptake of, of SharePoint, of Link, uh, and are you actually seeing uh, uh, broader interest in terms of the, the, the MS Office suite, or is it, is, it, is it a bit early for that? Thanks. Yeah, we, we have just been thrilled with the response of 365 in the marketplace, and certainly Exchange is a big driver, but SharePoint and Link are also very, very big. Uh, and, and, and are growing. As I said, SharePoint, the product itself, has a lot of traction and momentum in the marketplace and in the cloud is a beautiful thing for us to be able to do that. We've also, we made some licensing changes last year that made it very easy for our existing customers to onboard into our cloud services and that's sort of our updated enterprise agreement. The second thing though that we've been able to do is go into some places that we didn't have an EA uh, an enterprise agreement in place and be able to bring the services uh, to bear. It, it also makes for a very nice transition for if you're going to switch over from IBM Lotus Notes to be able to convert to the online service. Uh, it makes it pretty seamless there. So we're, we're really excited about both existing customers, new customers, and the ability to go hit both small and medium-sized businesses and the largest, as I said, we've had our initial response was sort of backward from what most people thought. We had the Fortune 500 come at us strong, and uh, most people thought we would start on the low end and work up, and that's not been the case. We're actually seeing both, and we had a lot of strong, very strong uh, implementations across companies like McDonald's globally uh, and others that really picked up the service and did great things with it. So again, we're, we're excited. We think there's big upside in it, and it's certainly one of the big things that we're gonna drive this year from a share standpoint, and I like the momentum we're on right now. Okay, with that, let's thank our panel. Thank you all very Thanks. much.